those OG digital cameras were big too. Like they were kind of yes. substantial. Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. Absolutely. It was, it was a commitment, but so was, you know, carrying around like a, a Kodak, you know, disposable camera that you had to wind each time and push the button to give it a flash. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two hosts, Jamie, joined by Anna. Anna, great to see you as always. Great to see you too, Jamie. And today we're joined by Mike Irwin, uh, somebody who is actually uh, introduced to us uh, via social media too, which is how the world works now yes. nowadays. So Mike, we're super excited to have you on here. I've uh, enjoyed talking to you before we, we hopped on the recording too. Uh, but yeah, if, for people who don't know you, Mike, uh, tell us uh, the, kind of the 30 seconds of who you are, what you do, and then we'll hop into that a little bit further. Anna's done a great job, actually. She, she knows probably more stuff about you yeah. than you know about yeah. you. We've got like four oh, pages goodness, of fact sheets. It, it you know she's it's the journalist in her she she goes <laughs> searching <Love it. laughs> awesome yeah so in you know in snapshot 2002 registered at west point 13 year army veteran and uh went on to found several organizations in the past decade team red white and blue helping to enrich the lives of america's veterans in the positivity project empowering america's youth to build positive relationships and simultaneously and in parallel working on leadership through two books i've co-authored lead yourself first and leadership is a relationship. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm excited to get into some of those. Uh, one question we ask all of our guests, cause we kind of, you know, on this show, we, we try to walk this line of kind of this uh, learning, you know, topics like leadership and practice management and also relating that back to money. So one of the things we like to ask people is, uh, do you remember what's the first money memory that pops into your mind, Mike? Oh, geez. Yeah. You know, probably the first one is that when I was six years old and I would, you know, I grew up in Syracuse, New York, so shoveling driveways, raking leaves, mowing lawns, and then I eventually became a paper boy. Uh, my parents was pretty straightforward. You have a savings account, half of everything you earn goes to the savings account. The other half of it, you can do whatever you want with it, but we're going to have you save half of it. And it's pretty amazing because I saved up quite a bit amount of money uh, throughout my early childhood by doing all these jobs and ended up putting into the stock market when I was like 13 or 14 and, uh, and ended up making a significant amount of money over the long term. And so it's something now that we're working on our own children with uh, this, the same principle. I was going to ask you, I know you, I know you have, you have five kids, right? Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Are, are you doing it with all of them or just the sele your so select right favorites? Now, <laughs> yeah. So just right. Yeah. The old, the older three, Matthias and Zelly, not quite uh, there. I think cognitively quite yet, but Matthias <laughs> is getting there, but yeah, it's, it's a really simple principle that has stuck with me all these years. And of course I didn't necessarily appreciate it at the time, but over time you realize the power of it. Oh, for sure. So what's your big purchase with all that? Well, I guess obviously you invested it. You didn't mm -hmm. spend a lot, but what was your big purchase that you remember? Yeah. So for me, like uh, now fast forwarding into, well, you know, so the sad part is I, I, I uh, you know, spent it on a fair amount of junk food. <laughs> I had a big sweet tooth <laughs> when I was growing up. So that's what I spent, spent a lot of my money on. My friend, my, my friends called me, the, uh, my parents called me the junk man. You know, because I just I loved <laughs> junk food and, and I, I still do, but I've gotten a lot better with it as I've gotten older. But, um, you know, the, the really answer, the first big thing, you know, was I contributed to my 1986 Honda Accord uh, that I bought. You know, uh, that was a part of it. Um, but, yeah, the biggest thing for me is when I went to West Point, they give you at the end of or in the middle of your junior year, they call it uh, the cow loan because juniors are referred to as cows um, and you get a big loan. And. Again, I put a lot of it into savings and all that, but a, a car, right, really was the, the big yeah, major purchase, you know, from there. And long before they were affordable, the uh, the Canon Elf digital camera, I'm pretty sure I got like the first version of a digital camera. It was like $600, <laughs> you know, oh and, uh, and I remember going up to the cadet store and buying that saying like, I love pictures and I want to have the ability to capture as many of them as possible. Those OG digital cameras were big too. Like they were kind of yes. substantial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. It was, it was a commitment, but so was, you know, carrying around like a, a Kodak, you know, disposable camera that you had to wind each time and push the button to give it a flash. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> and then yeah. have to wait forever to realize the pictures are horrible. Yes. And then you got to pay all that like, money. Oh. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, it's that joke of, you know, like you see some of these memes on the internet, but, you know, you know, you know, you know young, younger folks, they have no idea. You know I mean, they could, you know, you take a picture now, you look at it, you, you can, you can erase it, you can do it again, or you can, you know, take a burst so you can get, make sure that everyone's smiling. But half my pictures, you know, people were, their eyes closed or, you know, looking in the wrong direction. It was horrible. Yeah. And you'd like, you would, you go take them and you get back that like sleeve, right? You start looking through them and you'd be like, trash, trash, trash. Mm. Oh, one good one. Okay. We'll That's keep right. that one. Trash, trash, trash. Ooh, That's two it. Good you, took, you took 24, <laughs> hoping to get maybe five good ones. Yeah. <laughs> so. so you've mentioned a, a couple of times now, Mike, you, you got the, you know, the honor and privilege and made the decision to go to West Point. And mm-hmm. I know the military service was a big part of your family tradition, but what was the, you know, what, was there a point in time or a decision point where you kind of made that affirmative decision to go to West Point and, and what was it? Yeah. So I, growing up my entire life, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor. I volunteered in the ER and in community general hospital in Syracuse, New York, you know, watch the show ER. I mean, I just was really convinced that was my path. And, um, you know, my mom, one, one day she came home, she worked at Syracuse University. She said, Hey, have you ever thought about going to West Point? you know, the U S military Academy. And I never really had given much consideration to it. Some, some kids who go there, like know from the time they're like five or six, that that's where I want to go. Uh, I, I did not, I went down, I visited it. And what I saw there was really, uh, encapsulating. I was like, wow, like this place is really intense. Uh, and I knew like from the moment I, you know, walked off campus that first visit that I had to give it a shot. Otherwise I would always ask myself, what if, you know? And, and so that was, you know, really when I decided late my sophomore year that I need to apply here and I didn't, you know, know if I could get in or not, but, and then if I got in, then, then that same logic applied to, to the next step in the journey, which was, okay, I got accepted. I need to go because I need to know if I can, if I can make it here. Um, and I would not want to live with the regret of, well, I should have given it a chance, you know? So I was always open to the idea of not going, or once I go in there of leaving and saying, Hey, this place isn't for me, you know? Uh, and of course the way it works once you get there, you know, you become fully vested, you know, pretty quickly. So most people end up staying, even if they don't love it or they're not thriving in that first year, which is the case for a lot of cadets. So Mike, uh, I have a nephew who was accepted to West Point and he's just accepted to go. So what, what's your advice nice. to the young um, folks headed to West Point in the fall yeah. to, su- to succeed and thrive? Yeah. You know, I think that the probably the most important thing from a mindset standpoint, this is actually applicable, not just to West Point, but to certainly life beyond that is um, just knowing that the, the adversity is inevitable. You're, you're going to be tired. Mm-hmm. You're going to mess things up. You're going to make mistakes. And that's actually just a, an intentional part of the development journey, especially at West Point and especially in that first year, you know? Um, and so I think a lot of times, you know, cadets or people in general can beat themselves up uh, and they can really like allow a lot of doubt and a lot of rumination to set into their mind. And that's just a big thing that I would say is like to really don't, allow yourself to do that. You know, stay focused on the next, the next thing, learn from your mistakes and move forward. You know, and in terms of preparation, obviously the more physically fit you are going in, it helps. It definitely helps in terms of earning, you know, respect and, and being respected by your peers, but also by upperclassmen. So working hard on physical fitness is also just a very practical thing to do. Awesome. I'll pass those along. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And Mike, did, did you end up finding, I don't know, a a place or an exercise or something that helped you like, I don't know, like safe place or a grounding exercise there. Because I, you know, my, my, my cousin went to a, a military institute and he went to VMI, but I know mm-hmm. for him, there were certain things that I feel like his first year he had to kind of develop to say, Hey, I got to like ground myself when stuff gets tough because it's not easy, right? It's totally. going to be tough. You're going to be challenged. You're supposed to be challenged. Totally. Yeah. You know, for me, um, it was probably the baseball fields. You know, I played, so I was a recruited pitcher uh, uh, and I played baseball there for all four years. And that was a place where the locker room specifically, it was right there. It was off the, the marching plane, not too far. Like a lot of the sports fields were like far away, like half a mile, a mile away. Like the baseball field where we trained and practice was right there. Um, and so that was definitely a place of respite and a place where it things kind of seemed a little bit normal, you know, for me when sometimes they felt like they were going sideways. Um, but beyond that, I just think in general, like the power of being able to get to that place anywhere via a run or a walk is, is the, is the gold standard because, um, 
you know, it, it gives you a chance to break away, to work through things, but also get the endorphins going and, you know, flush out the cortisol, you know, running and walking, um, you know, at a brisk pace does so many good things. It helps your mind to like break free from a lot of the, the traps that it, it can put itself into. So uh, I'd say honestly, less a place and more of an activity. So Mike, when you were a cadet or even when, you know, moving into to your career, when was it that you started to kind of realize that solitude was a really valuable addition to, you know, your development as a person, as a leader, as a professional nonprofit founder, yeah. all the things. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it first started in 2004 and five on my deployment to Iraq. And I would take walks from where the TAC, the Tactical Operations Center, where I worked to the dining facility. And it was about uh, three quarters of a mile, you know, and in the summer when we had to wear body armor because we were getting bombed with mortars and rockets pretty much like, you know, three, four days a week. So they made the whole base walk around in your, your body armor with sappy plates, which weighed about 15 pounds each, you know, basically to protect your major organs. And uh, it, so it, was, it was not an easy walk, right, in the 95, 105 degree heat. Um, and so those times I would, I would almost always make those walks on my own. And I did it at first just out of necessity. But then I started to do it out of a desire to, to have some of that time to just like allow all the noise and all the intelligence that I was reading and processing to just filter out and the stress and the worry and the thinking about what am I going to do and, and a time to pray, a time to like all of it. Like it was just that it provided me like that solace and that space to do that. And which goes back to my previous comment, you know, about the power of an activity, right. Versus a specific place, you know, being something that could help to ground you. And that was very grounding for me. And, um, and so I found that out, you know, kind of by accident on that 2004 and five deployment, uh, and it was then the realization of, wow, like this is an important thing for me as a leader and as just as a human being in the world where there's a lot of things racing through my mind that I need to put it down, right? That you just can't keep go, 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 like nonstop because eventually like your brain just, it can't keep up. It gets worn down and there's all kinds of negative consequences to that. So that's where it started for me was on that deployment um, back in 0405. Mike, you mentioned in there leadership and your first book was Lead Yourself First. What inspired you to write that? So it started with that experience in Iraq. Uh, but then on my next deployments to Afghanistan in 06, 07, and 09, I again continued to practice solitude. Um, you know, when you're, when you're deployed, like, there's not a whole lot to do outside of work. And, you know, you can go back to your room and you can watch DVDs or whatever. But like, for the most part, I you know, spent a lot of my time reading and analyzing and thinking. So I was an intelligence officer. That was my job. And yeah, I just, I found it, you know, again, very cathartic and therapeutic to, to put myself into a, a late night run or a run around the airfield, or, you know, sometimes just to sit there in my office with the door closed. Um, but what really the catalyst was, uh, I read a, a speech in a magazine called The American Scholar, written by a guy named Bill Dershowitz. He was a professor at Columbia or Yale, you know, and he wrote this article that was based upon a speech that he gave at no place, no place, no other than West Point. So West Point invited him in to give a talk in the fall of 2009, as I was basically starting grad school. And it was all about solitude and leadership and the intersection between these two things. So I... I read it and was like, wow, this is a really fascinating article, thought provoking. I shared it with people before the times of social media via email. I sent it out to about 100 people on email. I said, hey, I, I think you'll find this as interesting as I did. Uh, check it out. And I never got more replies to an email, I think, than that one. I heard back from like 25% of the people that I sent it to. Holy cow, that's really important. Wow, what an important message. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, um, like, first of all, like, thanks for giving that talk and for writing this article. This is really, thought provoking. I'm here at grad school. I'm in the army. You know, I really think you should write a book on, on this topic. And he said, Hey, you know, thanks a lot. I appreciate, you know, the, you know, the note, but, uh, I'm really not a leadership expert. Um, and I'm working on another book. So if you want to read that book, uh, then you're going to have to write it yourself. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> there you go. So, so I was like, yeah, I think I'm good. I, I don't want to do that. But like, it, it kept nagging at me this, like this, like little, like in the back of my brain of like, you could write a book on this. You should write a book on this. You should, you should try to contribute to the, to the broader leadership space with a book about this particular idea. And, uh, and then I partnered up with my co-author, federal judge, Ray Kethledge, 
who it resonated with him in a very different way. I'm a big extrovert. He's a big introvert. Um, he's a lawyer, right? I'm an army officer. And so we had these different skill sets and different personality traits. And, you know, we brought them together, you know, for a period of seven years to research and to work on that book. And uh, the end result is something we're super proud of. So Mike, do you think that a lot of people might be reluctant to unplug and engage in that type of solitude? Like I know for me, I, I run every morning and that's my, I don't like to run with people. I'm not a, like a, you know, very extroverted person and that's my time to meditate and kind of think about mm -hmm. the day. And I love that, but I think some people might be reluctant to, do you agree with that? And if so, why do you think they're that way and how can they overcome that? <laughs> Absolutely. People are definitely, a lot of people are definitely reluctant to do it. Um, <laughs> one, being, being alone with our own thoughts can be intimidating. Mm -hmm. Um, like a lot of things, like if you go from like couch to 5k, right? Like your first couple of you know, your first month of running is awful, right? It's not mm -hmm. like you just like snap a finger and all of a sudden it feels great. No, it, it always feels good when you're done. <laughs> right. But mm -hmm. it doesn't feel good when you're like sitting there grinding out like your first run of a mile, like literally in your entire life or in, in 15 years, solitude is the same way. I think people often expect to just like go give it a shot and do it for a, a, a run or a session uh, and, and have it feel magical, right? It, no, it takes like anything else, whether you're working at getting better at your sleep. You know, I track my sleep, you know, via my aura ring for the past two years now, after 41 years of just skewing sleep. Um, and it's fascinating, but it didn't, like I've gotten better at sleep, not, not overnight, but through the commitment to the process. So solitude is very much the same sort of thing. You have to commit to the process of it. And the, you reap the benefits and the rewards over the long run, not necessarily over like the first time you try it. Um, but answering your question specifically is that, yeah, because it's often to be uncomfortable to be alone with our thoughts. Um, and uh, a lot of us, you know, we've been conditioned to be addicted to our technology, to smartphones, to social media, to 24 seven news cycles, to all of it, uh, that it feels kind of weird to not be plugged in or have your phone like at the ready. And so those two things right there, I think, contribute to the sense of unease that a lot of people feel. Um, and my message, of course, to people is always the same. Just, just try it. Try it for you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day for a couple of weeks. Uh, and this is what people who meditate will tell you the same thing. Like just if you earnestly give it your very best effort for a couple of weeks, tell me that you don't feel better. Tell me that it doesn't make a difference for you and that it's not worth it. And very few people come back and say that. Most people say, yeah, it does work. It is worth the 20 minutes a day. I feel better, right? And now it's just a question of just like with our diet, we know we should only have so many cookies or pieces of pie, right? We should only have so many drinks. We should only have so much caffeine, right? Uh, how do we make sure that we don't cross over that threshold? Same thing with solitude and, and reflection. How can you make it a priority? You're not going to get it every day for most people because they might have a lot of things going on, but how do you not completely fall off the wagon, you know, and, and then have to like work really hard to get yourself back on it. How do you at least maintain some semblance uh, of this as a practice and a discipline in your life? And you brought this up a little, Mike, uh, one of the reasons, you know, is adding words to it though, is some people might be a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of solitude with themselves because they're not as good with that relationship with themselves as they might want to be. Totally. And so it feels uncomfortable, right? Yes. Um, you doubt yourself, you write all those things. And uh, so I guess it's a two part question, you know, why is working on that relationship with yourself so important? And then how does that impact re other relationships that you have? Yeah. I mean, I think you just, you kind of, you, in uh, my answer of the first is essentially the answer to the second. So yep. spot on, like, <laughs> You know, uh, your relationship with yourself shows up in every single relationship you have with other people, right? That's the, the main argument of lead yourself first is that you, you need to be able to be the best that you can be in terms of your state of mind, your mental health, your physical health, your preparation, your everything. Um, so that not just for the sake of being selfish and being the very best that, that you can be at everything, like life is a team sport. You know, and so you can be the best teammate for your family, for your coworkers, for your company, for your anything, you know, you know, the nonprofits you volunteer for, your church that you go to, like whatever you do, like you, you are better for everybody when you are leading yourself first. And, and I think to me, that's the connection because, you know, Jamie, the question often will come with people, which one book's about solitude, one's about relationships. Like what's, what gives? Like that doesn't seem to make sense. And then I explain and I walk through it. 
And the, I build the bridge between the first I, book and, the, and that main idea and the second book and that main idea. And, and then it's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. That makes a lot of sense, right? You, you know, if you consistently are showing up for other people, other people, other people, and, you, and you're not prioritizing your own self-care, that you're not you know, reading enough books, listening to enough podcasts you know, to get better, that you're eating healthy, getting enough sleep and doing all those things, everyone else suffers with, uh, via their interactions with you when you're not doing that, you know? And so, but at the same time, if all you do is take care of yourself and you get 10 hours of sleep a night and all you do is like, you know, self-care, 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 well, that's great. You might be having like this beautiful uh, sort of existence, but you're not making a very big difference in the world most likely, right? Because like making a difference in the world means leaning in, having hard conversations, um, you know, doing hard things with other people, uh, all the things that like teamwork requires. Yeah, honestly, you can't go live in the cabin in the woods and hide from the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah see, see, Mike, I tell, I tell Jamie that's my dream is to get a cabin in yeah. New Mexico in the woods and write books and be by myself. I love solitude. I'm a yes. big fan. <laughs> yes. People, not the biggest fan. <laughs> yeah. No, but this is the thing, right? Like, so here's what we know, though, uh, about the research, you know, in positive psychology that even for the biggest introverts and people who thrive off of solitude and being alone, like my co-author, Ray Kethledge, he would go up to his cabin in like northern Michigan for like like four days at a time. No phone, no, like no cell phone. There was like a landline there that like, you know, but no internet, you know, mm -hmm. none of that. Um, and but what the research shows us is that even people who thrive on solitude and big introverts, like we still need people. We still need mm -hmm. relationships in our lives, even though inevitably they bring stress and they cause turbulence and all those things. That's ultimately like the magic of, of life. It's, it's not about what we do as individuals. It's what we do, you know, in community with our families, with our friends, our teammates, our coworkers, et cetera. Being a, that good teammate. No, but I, I agree wholeheartedly. Like I always get very nervous to do things. And Jamie was telling me like, well, you always enjoy it. And I always end up enjoying it and like getting, yeah. you know, um, life from it. So I, I agree with that. Totally. Well, like 95% of the time you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, 95% of the time I do enjoy Once it. Although I do stress out going yeah. up <laughs> like, oh man, I have to, you know, cause I mean, I, I, I work remotely, so I don't people very often. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it takes me a lot to get into it. Totally. But um, Mike, to shift gears a little bit into your, your volunteering, your giving back and on all the organizations that you've started, talk to us about what inspired you to do all of those things and what you get back from it and what, what you love about it. Yeah. So, you know, so this gets into a lot of the research of positive psychology. For me, honestly, a lot of it starts with my family. You know, my, uh, my parents, you know, when I was young, like we would volunteer a lot. We would do, uh, you know, uh, meals on wheels. You know, we would go meals on wheels, mm -hmm. like, you know, and deliver. We would visit with some of the older people who were shut in in our neighborhood. Um, you know, and so I grew up in a very service minded family. Um, my mom was like the little league president. Um, I mean, I just would see my parents do these things. Um, even how they interacted with their parents as they got older, right? Just being like good servant leaders. And, and then from there, as I got into life and I started seeing it in the military and a huge emphasis in the military about servant leadership. I mean, no one's in the military to get rich, right? You, you, it ain't happening, um, right? So you then see the service element of uh, being in the military. And then I go to grad school and I, and I basically uncover, you know, like all these articles and all this, you know, research in positive psychology that clearly points out that the number one driver of life satisfaction is the quality of your relationships with, with your family, your friends, your teammates, your coworkers. Um, you know, and so basically how you show up for other people uh, is not just important because, you know, kind of what goes around comes around karma, call it whatever you will. Um, so there's actually like a, uh, like a reason to want to be philanthropic and to be generous and to help other people. But it also, ironically, makes you feel better, right? And it gives you a sense of purpose in life when other people are counting on you. And so a lot of this, you know, research of positive psychology really sort of cemented within me, you know, I didn't really overlay on, you know, like, so I'm a Catholic. And so growing up, like, thinking through how do you, like, you know, bring your faith to life to serve the needy, to serve people who really need you. So all these different, like, sort of layers in my life, you know, all kind of, you know, very clearly painted this picture of like, okay. This is how you're supposed to live life. And look, like me, me, like everyone else, we all feel the pull to look out for ourselves, you know, to take care of ourselves. You hear, you know, you do you, look out for number one. So to be clear, like, like the lead yourself first mission, you know, 
is not that, right? Like that is very much like you need to take care of yourself so that, right, you can point towards, you know, serving and leading and doing things with and for others, right? And that, you, that, that that's why you need to lead yourself first, not lead yourself first so that you live this, you know, you know, perfectly peaceful existence. And so for me, like when I look at all those layers of my faith and the research and positive psychology and how I grew up and my experience in the military and then creating a big nonprofit in Team Red, White and Blue, right, where we've changed and saved veterans' lives, you see that and you feel that and you realize that there's nothing really that can make me feel as good as like hearing from a veteran who's like, I'm here today because of the organization you started. That's like, wow, like, that'll just take your breath away, you know? Um, and really there's no amount of like individual glory or square feet in my house or, you know, you know, horsepower in my car that can possibly feel that good to hear from, from somebody that they're here or that they're thriving because of a contribution that you made to their life. And so um, selfishly, I'm in the pursuit constantly of doing that, of making a difference, a positive difference in people's lives, however I can. That's awesome. I love the the work, the red uh, team, red, white, and blue. It's just such an amazing mission and organization. I, um, my father was a veteran. My my husband is a veteran. And that aspect of integration back into society, and you know, um, my husband has had 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 trouble with that in the past. And so I love the the work you do there. And one of the to tie into that, one of the questions is, you know, our industry is always looking for career changers and people to come in and fill the pipeline. And I think veterans are just such a wonderful wealth of information and, and you know, resource knowledge and to come into the profession and, and possibly work here. So what are your thoughts on that? Why, what are some of the benefits of advisors working with veterans, hiring veterans, bringing them onto the, into their firms? Yeah. So veterans are, look, so veterans are a, a slice and a, a representative sample size of America. And, and so that's, that's starting point, a point for that. Um, so what you often get though, is for many of them in that age, 18 to 21 or 22, for those who, cause a lot of them just do one tour, right? They sign up and they do three or four years. Um, you know, while a lot of their peers are in college, you know, and sort of discovering their future that way, um, you know, people in the military are discovering it in a different way. And a lot of it is College is like freedom and choose all these things. Being in the military is like you're told what to wear, how to look with your haircut in your room. right? And so in many ways, it's about 175 degrees different. Um, but what you often get is you, you see the character fortification, uh, uh, thinking of other people, uh, because that's what you're, hey, look it out for your battle buddy, your ranger buddy to your left or to your right. Like that mindset is drilled you know, into uh, service members. Um, you know, and then lots of the things like being places on time and, you know, uh, even though I was, I was a few minutes late to this call myself, so, you know, it doesn't I always. I have to admit that, Mike. Yeah, that's all right. Well, yeah, you know, that, the They author... didn't know that. Yeah, that's they... the authenticity speaking, you know. The but, show uh... shows up at the same time either way. Yeah. That's, that's the great thing about it. But, 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 try, but trying to, you know, be places on time, like, you know, when you're not, you know, always get it right. But like, so a lot of those factors from the military experience then carry over you know, into civilian life, not, not all of them and not all the time, certainly are not for all veterans, but, you know, you often do see those kinds of things play out, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in service members as they become veterans and, and, and leave the military behind. So, yeah, I mean, uh, they're loyal. Yeah, certainly a, a, a big emphasis placed on loyalty, like in the Army specifically, the seven Army values, loyalty, duty, respect, um, you know, honor, selfless, cur- uh, selfless service. Um, integrity, personal courage, those kinds of things are core values in the army. And, and, and so they get, they get really, you know, ingrained into your mind and and into your heart. I feel like punctuality has basically been like blown up the last three years too. Like, I mean, yeah. Like yes, like yesterday I had somebody no show then email me afterwards. Hey, sorry, blah, blah, blah. This yeah. morning I had like a four hour block and like last night I was like, okay, I got to get up in the morning, probably like 5 a.m. to get to New York for this event. And I'm like, you know, I haven't heard from anyone in that thing in like two weeks. I'm just going to yeah. message a guy real quick. And he's yeah. like, oh, we decided to move it. Did nobody yeah. reach out to you? And I was like, no, nobody reached out to me. And he's like, oh, okay, it's moved. Yeah. And I'm like, well, like, I'm glad I did that because I almost yeah. took a train up at 5 a.m. to get to New York to find out that, like, this room feels really empty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, uh, I agree with you. I mean, I, that's my observation as well. Uh, to me, I would call that, like, right, just like, uh, and not that it always all happens in disrespect, but I would call that, like, respect. Mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah. And I would, I would, I would lump that under this idea of the human skills. Yeah, that's it's a human mm -hmm. skill to know that hey, if someone's on tap to spend time with you or to, you know, you're you're going to meet them for something or you're going to host them that that if that gets canceled or delayed, that you would that you would reach out to yeah. them, you know. And I think in general, not just punctuality, Jamie, I go bigger picture is that in many ways, our human skills are not evaporating, right? But they're definitely dissipating. They are, they are uh, as the world gets more digital, as it gets, you know, uh, less human to human interaction and more mm -hmm. virtual, uh, there's no doubt that you're getting, people are getting less reps with what does it mean, you know, to have good human or people skills. And this is something that I'm mm -hmm. beating on big time, right? You know, with my work in the Positivity Project, my, my co-founder, Jeff Bryan, and I talked about it just this morning, you know, um, Yes, school, you need to educate children on math and reading and writing and all that. Uh, but ultimately, how are we also developing the human skills, you know, in, in our, the children of our nation? Um, because those are very, very important as the world gets more AI driven, uh, you know, machine learning, all the, all the changes that are coming down the, uh, the pike here. And they're coming fast right here in 2023. Mm -hmm. They are moving out. Um, you can mm -hmm. see it and, and everyone's talking about it and thinking about it. And so to me, like, this is the, this is a big fundamental question. How do we as adults and certainly as raising children, how do we ensure that those basic fundamental human skills, you know, do not get diminished um, to such an extent that, um, that we have this happening, this kind of stuff happening all the time, right? Which has definitely been on the rise in my own anecdotal experience as well. So Mike, that brings, uh, begs the question, like a lot of the younger professionals coming into the, to the industry and into all industries, I guess, what are some, what are some advice to firm owners to help the younger generation cultivate those people skills and, and kind of, especially since, you know, they went through COVID and, and all the, it was hard to build those skills in this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the part of it is like, ugh, we got to really, and look at, there's a whole host of things I think that, you know, the research would point us to. Certainly with younger folks, it's limiting screen time, pushing and really uh, uh, encouraging, if not forcing, you know, face-to-face -face interaction outside of school time or outside of sports. Um, you know, obviously there's been an explosion in video games, explosion in social media, explosion in Netflix and YouTube and all the things digital, right, have just continued to add more and more content creators, more and more things that are very tempting to pull people in to spend their time there. And I think it's fine to do some of those things some of the time. You know, but I think it's really bad to do lots of those things practically all the time, which is what I think we see happening for a lot of folks. So, you know, whether you're a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a caretaker or a coach or a teacher, anywhere where you're interacting with children, and especially as they get to that 11, 12, 13 range, you know, preteen and the teenager, I think having these conversations and reminding, you know, children about how important the human skills are to being a human being, you know, mm -hmm. um, like it's this concept of like, you know, putting the human in the human being, you know, um, being truly human as a human being is, is not something that is just happens by osmosis anymore. There's too much digital input and digital exhaust and all those things. So it does require a degree of intentionality. And I think that if, especially if we're an adult, we have to look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, am I, am I role modeling this properly? I think all of us can agree that like, we're not like perfect. None of us are like, um, but what are we doing and what can we do more of to ensure that we're having these intentional discussions with children? Again, that we teach, that we coach, that we, that we live next to, right? They don't have to be your own kids. It, it can be like kids that you interact with, right? Um, in various domains of your life. And I think that that to me is, is what we need a, a really intense degree of intentionality. I love it. The, Last question that we have here for you today, Mike, is um, uh, one that we you know have been, I guess, bringing up for probably about a year now, which is uh, I'll be interested to hear what your answer is. But what does freedom mean to you personally? <sighs> yeah, so I think of that word, obviously, first and foremost, as you know, someone who served the country in America and my, my probably first quote on freedom would be you know, we hear all, you know, freedom is not free, right? Um, or another quote out there that freedom has a taste, um, you know, I'm botching the quote here a little bit, but you know, that uh, those who have protected the freedom, it, it has a different flavor than for those who have never, you know, you know, pr you know, protected the freedom, you know, of America. And so these quotes kind of honestly sound a little um, either, you know, cliche or in some regards, like, 
not arrogant, but like, dude, people can experience freedom in a lot of different ways, you know? Um, but it's just this whole idea that if you fought to protect freedom, you certainly have a, a deeper uh, appreciation than, than your, than your prior self, right. Who, who just, just reap the benefits of living in a free society. You know, and then I think about freedom in the lens of, you know, how I talk about solitude. Solitude is the freedom from the input from other minds. And that's how we define solitude, right? It's not a, a physical place to go to. It's, it's when the mind is free from the inputs from other minds. So, um, you know, I don't have any deep insight into like, you know, philosophically, you know, you know, freedom, um, you know, but I do believe, you know, and I'll never forget when I was running in Central Park, someone had written like some quotes around the running trail, you know, in New York City. And one of the quotes was, um, if you want to create freedom for yourself, uh, create it for others. Right. And I remember being like, wow, that's like a really interesting insight. Right. So like to me, I, I guess what I would I would sort of bring all those together and say that, you know, freedom, whether we're talking like the ability to choose and, and do whatever we want, uh, you know, like there's some degree of freedom there. Um, you know, just because we can do that doesn't mean like that you should. Right. Like I'm you can be free to do whatever you want. Right. So you probably have heard the quote before. Uh, you know, it comes from Viktor Frankl, survivor of the Holocaust, right? Uh, America mm -hmm. has the, the statue of, uh, of liberty, right? And freedom, right? On the East Coast, on the West Coast, it should have a statue uh, of discipline, right? You know, because discipline and doing what's right is what makes freedom actually uh, valuable, you know? Um, so again, a bunch of different thoughts there, you know, uh, quotes and ideas that kind of, you know, reflect different, vantage points of like how I view it. But to me, ultimately, you know, uh, it, it is, you know, you know, from an, at least an American society standpoint is something that, you know, I never take for granted for a single day, knowing that, you know, not everyone feels that they've got the same degree of freedom, right. You know, maybe that I have. Um, uh, but I certainly look back at, at my time serving in the military and, how, and trying to bring freedom and do my small part to help people be more free is something that I'm very proud of because, um, I do, I do think it is something we should, uh, however you define it, try to bring to more people throughout our country and throughout the world. I was excited to hear your version of it because uh, I knew it was going to come a little bit different from a yeah. veteran than it does from others. And it's, it's really true, right? We ask that question and the word means a different thing, really, once you've served to uh, here in the United States and probably other places in the world yeah. too. And, and, as, and you probably often think about it, right. It's financial freedom, right. Or like, however people mm -hmm. think about it as right. It's like the ability, again, I just, I, I guess I would say like that I really guard against the idea of like to be able to do whatever I want. Right. Like that's, you know, I know some people have kind of think about it that way, but it's really like, it goes back to that Victor Frankl quote for me that like, yeah, you might be able to do whatever you want, but like, that doesn't mean you should, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, I love it. Well, Mike, Thank you for coming on the show today. This has been awesome. Uh, you know, and actually your your just your talks about solitude to me. There've been three or four super interesting points. And uh I actually love, I mean, honestly, one of my favorite parts about it was when you talked about that solitude um is a freedom from, you know, other minds or yeah. you know. And that's a really that's a really great way to put it. So we appreciate everything that you're doing out there. Uh where's the best place for people to interact with you or some of your websites for your organizations? Yeah, so you can you can find me on LinkedIn or, or Instagram or Twitter, Irwin R W B. Um, I'm actually uh, considering launching my own podcast next year. We'll see, right? Uh, I, I think uh, I got to the point now where I, I enjoy being a guest on podcasts and having discussions with people. And so I'm, you <laughs> yeah. know, thinking, you know, of trying to you know, structure it and think about it in my, in my own self. But no, nothing available there yet. But you know, the, the easiest place is just on social media and, you know, team rwb.org to be able to join. Whether you're a veteran or not, if you support veterans, you can join and be a part of the team and help us to enrich veterans' lives and, you know, the Positivity product as well. You can just find all that just through basic Google search and see the 850 schools that we work with as well. It's awesome. Well, my, my suggestion is you do a solitude podcast, but you shoot it only in like public areas, right? <laughs> so you, like you just do your solo mm -hmm. podcast in like the middle of Times Square. And like yeah, just, there you go. People just buzzing. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that would be solitude, pretty interesting. Solitude like among it. many. Yeah. I like it. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you all both well, so much. You. I appreciate yeah, the conversation and thanks a lot for having me on. Yeah. Anna and Mike, thanks for being on here too. And thank you everybody else for listening to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast.